We hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Amen. So thankful for uh, the beautiful weekend that we had Friday night, the uh, youth explosion. What a tremendous time we had in the Holy Ghost. And then uh, heard great reports uh, from the ladies' day yesterday and uh, excited about all that happened. Probably talk more about that in a bit. And we're just thrilled, uh, looking forward to the rest of today. Brother Mayo going to be ministering in the second uh, part of this service and then again tonight. So let's be praying, believing for great, great things. Amen. Uh, Psalm chapter number one is uh, a passage that I, I want us to spend some time in this morning. And I want to use it uh, in light of what we talked about, the perfect pattern. And uh, just to bring us uh, maybe a little review for the, maybe those that were not here, um, the Bible presents the idea that for, for everything, there is uh, a perfect ideal in the mind of God. And we can see this way back in creation. Of course, um, John 1, that gives us kind of a New Testament um, beginning, like the book of Genesis, begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, the thought, the mind of God. And that Word, the Bible says, was with God and was God. And verse number 3 of John 1, all things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in the mind of God, before he ever created, before he ever said, let there be light, before he ever separated the waters above from the waters beneath, before he ever, on day three, separated the waters uh, beneath from the dry land, made the earth and sea, before he ever made the sun, moon, stars, before he ever created the sea creatures and then the land creatures and finally the zenith of his creation, uh, formed man of the dust of the, of, of the ground. Before he did any of that, in the mind of God, there was a perfect pattern that was in his mind. And from that, the Bible says he made man in the image of God. And I, I believe that if, if we can just begin to understand uh, how high God's expectations, maybe a better word are, maybe a better word is his, 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 his desire for us. And uh, I think it would, it would inspire every one of us here today. God intends for us to be something great in the kingdom of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that the, the ideal that we are to be, that we find in Ephesians chapter number four, the Bible says that uh, that the ministry, he, the Bible says there's a fivefold ministry. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And he gave them for the perfecting of the saints. I don't know about you, but I want to be perfected today. I am not satisfied with where I am today. He gave it for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And here's what's beautiful. Till we all come... In the unity of the, uh, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What that scripture is saying is all preaching, teaching, uh, evangelizing, prophesying is done with the idea in mind of you as individuals and the church corporately being like the perfect man, Jesus Christ. As we're here today, the beauty of, of us coming and praying, hearing the word of God, there is a growth that should be occurring. There is progress that should be occurring. Where are we growing to? Where are we progressing towards? We are progressing towards the image of the perfect man. I, I, just to put it, it bluntly, we want to be like Jesus. There's an old song that we used to sing. I think we, we still sing. Maybe we should sing it more. It says, to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like him. I want to, I want to be like Jesus today. I believe it's the will of God for us to strive to be like him. In fact, in Hebrews chapter number 11 and 12, the Bible tells us, uh, in Hebrews 11, of course, the, uh, the hall of faith, the great, great, great heroes of faith, everyone from, um, Abel and, 
um, Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, of course, Sarah's in there and Moses and, and just incredible individuals. The Bible uh, wraps it up by saying in Hebrews chapter 12 that we are, we are compassed about, we are surrounded with uh, a great cloud of witnesses. We are literally surrounded by incredible saints of God. My dad and I, and I was just talking with Sister Molander a minute ago, we went a couple weeks ago to visit uh, Brother Paul Price uh, up in the uh, Napa Valley, and uh, one of the great, great men of God that, that, uh, of, of this century and I guess of the, the 20th century as well. He's 97 years old uh, as of Valentine's Day, February the 14th, an incredible man of God. And uh, as we sat there and we're talking to him, and, and he would, would, would reminisce, and my dad would reminisce, and talking about uh, great men of God that he knew, and my dad has known, and, and uh, different ones that we have got to know in, in my life. And I, I, was le- I left that, that, that encounter with so many emotions just stirred up in me, but one of the greatest emotions that was stirred up in me, and I don't even know how if, I, if I can express this correctly, was the feeling that we are not alone in this apostolic journey. We, we are surrounded and compassed about by a, a, a cloud of witnesses, by, by all the way back through your Bible. There is apostolic secession of great men of God that lived and ministered in their generation. They would pass on and pass this truth to another generation. They would receive it. They would preach it. It would be transferred to another generation. And then now, you have Brother Price and my dad, myself, and there's other young men much younger than me that are now receiving this truth. And I was stirred to just thank God for this apostolic truth and for men and women of God that have held on. Anybody thankful for people that love this truth and brought it to us? Amen. I'll just stop and tell the elders in this house today. We thank God for you. We thank God for elders that love this truth. Thank God for pillars of the church. Amen. Thank God for people that have been faithful in their support with tithes and offerings and attendance so that we can be in this house. Anybody thankful for the cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by? Amen. We're not in this alone. I'm going to tell you uh, just something, an easy uh, a leap of logic is we, we better not miss it, church. There's been too much that have been vested into this for us to miss it. We, we, you can lose it all in one generation. All it takes is for one generation to quit preaching that there is one God and his name is Jesus. All it takes is for one generation to quit preaching repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, and you no longer have an apostolic church. All it takes is for one generation to quit preaching the essentiality of holiness and righteousness before God, and you no longer have the church that Paul talked about, or whoever wrote Hebrews, where he said, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. We can't afford to miss it. But I, I'm thankful today to tell you that we got, a, we got an apostolic church. We got an apostolic secession. We ain't changing this word one bit. There's one God and his name is Jesus. It's still Acts 2.38 and it's still holiness. Anybody thankful? Anybody got your mind made up? We ain't changing it for anybody. Amen. I know that most of the young people are out working, doing Sunday school in the classes. But if you're a young person in this place, get a hold of this truth. Link up to that secession all the way back to to Peter and Abraham and beyond. And understand we have a great cloud of witnesses. Can you say amen? But after we read in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says we're surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. The Bible basically lets us know that we're not looking at any of that cloud of witnesses for our perfection. As great as Abel was, as incredible as Noah and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, they are ultimately, while they inspire us, they are not the pattern for our lives. When I, when I seek for perfection, when you are seeking for perfection, we, we don't put Noah in front of us and say, that's exactly who I want to be because Noah, we understand, had there's some, there's some times in his life that are not the best. 
Abraham was a good man, a great man, father of the faithful. But Abraham ultimately is not the perfect pattern for your life. We, we thank God for Isaac and Jacob and, 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 and Deborah and Barak and all the other heroes of faith. We thank God for Samson. But they are not the inspiration, the perfect, ideal, pristine pattern for our life. The Bible lists all of them and says we're surrounded by them. Thank God for them. We're not going to let them down. But we are looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. You want to know what the pattern is? We're looking unto Jesus. You know who we need to be like? We need to be like Jesus. You know who we need to talk like? I want to talk like Jesus. I want to think like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want my character to be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. And this is a huge principle in our lives. If you can begin to look, if you want to fix the broken things in your life, look to the perfection that is found in the perfect image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful you know who Jesus is today? Amen. And so we're going to look at Psalms 1 in light of this idea of the perfect pattern. If you want to, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 1. We're going to read through this today. Psalm 1 is a beautiful description of what our lives should be, of what this church will be, of what God intends for us individually and collectively. He begins with a contrasting view in verse number one. In other words, he kind of paints a picture of where the reality of life. He says in verse one, um, and and, and really in this verse, he gives a a three-part progressive picture of, 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 of how we can devolve in our human state. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture of us degenerating. And three, he gives three examples of what, of what we could be like. And, and each one of these examples is a progressive degeneration of the human state, getting worse instead of improving. He says that there is a blessing for the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, that there are, there's, there's three, uh, three verbs that he uses here. He talks about a man, an individual, a woman, an individual, whoever, walking first, then standing, and then sitting. Walking, everybody say walking. Everybody say Standing. And everyone say sitting. This is a, a progressive state of somebody going from walking to they stop and they stand and then they sit. It is a, it's, it's a, a continual, uh, basically more comfortable attitude, more uh, satisfied attitude. And walking, standing, and sitting is, is, is talked about in, uh, in the context of, of counsel of the ungodly, the way of sinners, and the seat of the scornful. So you have the counsel. Everybody say counsel. Say it with me. Counsel. Path. Everybody say path. And then seat. Everybody say seat. You are, uh, the Bible talks about this, this, this man that, that needs to stay away from these things, progressing from counsel to the path to the seat. Walking, standing, sitting. He is moving from counsel, which I, I would use in light of a place of, of, of receiving counsel, of receiving advice. And uh, I'm thankful for godly counsel, but I'm going to tell you, you've got to be careful for ungodly counsel. Amen. One conversation can change your life. Just ask Eve in the garden talking to the serpent. Counsel. And that counsel, he says, can degenerate from a counsel where it's, it's, a, it's advice to it becoming a path, a direction. I'm going to tell you, when you get counsel, be careful that, if it, that it's right counsel because that counsel will turn into direction for your life. If you get bad counsel, it can turn into a direction and a path which ultimately can lead to a, 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 a seat, a settled place where you sit in that place. You receive counsel, you headed in that direction, and now you are there in a, in a settled place. You're now calcified. That's who you are. 
and, and you've become the counsel that you received. I, I'm going to just tell you again, I want good counsel in my life. I want to surround myself with a multitude of godly counsel, I, especially when it becomes the decisions that really matter. I want good counsel in my life. And uh, it, because what happens again, that counsel leads to direction, which leads to a place where you are, you are settled and calcified in that place. I think of the story of Lot's wife. The Bible lets us know that she, she was in, in, a, in a, a sinful place, Sodom and Gomorrah, and she, was, she had obviously been affected by her surroundings. And uh, there, was, there was a point where she's pulled out of the city of Sodom, and uh, the angels come, they bring her and Lot, two daughters, and, and they're running out of the city. She's trying to change from the council and the direction that she's had in her life. The angels say, but whatever you do, don't turn around and look back. Whatever you do, don't return to that counsel, that direction you had before. And the Bible says she couldn't help herself. There was things she loved there, people she loved, and she turned. And uh, in that moment, as she turned, the Bible says that she was, she was, she was metamorphosed, transformed into a, a pillar of salt. And I don't, can you imagine? I, I don't know how long that pillar of salt lasted, if it was there for a while or if it was there until the first rain, but a lady that turns and, 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 and perhaps with fear on her face, she was forever calcified, forever settled into a monument to bad decisions, bad counsel, bad direction. There was no longer option for her turning around. She is forever turning back to Sodom. When we think of Lot's wife, we don't think about any good things she did in life. We think about a woman that turned back. When we think about Lot's wife, we don't think about perhaps she was a good mother at times, a good wife to, to Lot, a good daughter-in-law perhaps, we don't know, or, or nephew and, or niece-in-law to Abraham. We just know that Lot's wife turned back and she was forever settled in that moment. I'll tell you, church, our decisions will make us our decisions will define us. My dad says often we make our decisions, but we are made by our decisions. And God says, be careful, be careful, be careful what you hear. Be careful the counsel you receive from yourself, from, your, from others around you. Make sure it's good stuff because that counsel will lead to a direction. And that direction will ultimately lead to a place, a seat where you stay, where you are established in that, whether good or bad. I'm I'm going to tell some dads today, make sure you make good choices for your family. Ma'am, I'm talking to some moms today. Make sure you pray and are careful because your decisions is what your family will be. I believe I'm talking to a bunch of people today that would say, God, I want to be everything that God wants me to be. I'm looking for the perfect pattern that God has in my life. So walking and standing and sitting. Counsel and path and seat. The Bible says that, that this, this, this counsel is the counsel of the ungodly. Everybody say ungodly. That this path is the path or the way of sinners. And I don't mean to wear you out too much, but we're going we're gonna to leave you alone after verse 1. Everybody say sinners. And the seat of the scornful. Everybody say scornful. As walking to standing to sitting is a generation or at least a, a progress as counsel to path to seat is a progression, so is ungodly to sinners to scornful. Ungodly refers to a wicked attitude, but sinner refers to actions, sin, doing them. It's more, you know, it's one thing to think bad stuff. It's another thing to do bad stuff. Amen. And I'll just tell you today, some people say, if you think it, you might as well do it. Let me just tell you, don't think it. Don't think bad thoughts. But if you think bad thoughts, don't do the bad thoughts. It's much better just to have thought them. Oh, yeah. It's much better just to have thought, you know, it'd be real nice to ram this car in front of me because they cut me off. Just think it. Don't do it. Amen. Don't let those thoughts, that attitude lead to deeds. Because if it leads to deeds, that can lead to a place the Bible calls the seat of the scornful. So given to scorn, to a debauched lifestyle that mocks now, that makes fun of the holy. A smart aleck uh, attitude that scoffs at the righteous things of God. I tell you today, I don't want to go down that path 
pathway. I don't want to walk and stand and sit. I don't want to go from counsel to path to seat. I don't want my thoughts to lead to actions that, that lead to a whole attitude of a scornful mocking the things of God. But I believe I'm talking to people this day that would say, I want to reject that. I want to be everything that God wants me to be. And verse one's a little bit heavy, but the Bible does say this, that there is a blessing when you stay away from that stuff. Ultimately, there is a blessing when you stay away from the way or the walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed are you when you don't stand in the way of sinners. Sir, there's a blessing when you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. I'm going to just tell you, I want the blessings of God on my life. Amen, amen. Some of you may be saying, well, there he goes again. He's going to talk about blessing again. Oh, yeah, I am. I'm going to talk about blessing till Jesus comes because I want, I desire, I hunger for the blessings of God on my life. I want the blessing of God on every family in this church. I believe it's the will of God for this church to be blessed of God. I believe it's God's will for you to be blessed in every area of your life. Where did the thought come from that God doesn't want to bless you? Where did the thinking come from that God wants to hurt you? Where did the thought come from that God doesn't want to do good things for his people? I've come to tell you, he's a God of blessing. He's a God that wants to bless you and smile upon you and bring good things into your life. Yes, we got to behave in such a manner that the blessings of God have got to come. Yes, we've got to live in a way that we have shunned from walking in the way or the counsel of the ungodly. Yes, we got to stay away from the way of sinners in the seat of the scornful. But I am telling you, when we do that, there are blessings that come from Almighty God. And if you don't want the blessings of God, I'm going to just tell you, there's only really two options. It's blessing and cursing. I want the blessings of God. Is there anybody that would say, I want to be blessed in every area of my life? Sir, you need to start praying. God, bless my home. Come on, moms and dad, let this be part of your, your vocabulary. He's a God of blessing. When you pray, God bless my wife, bless my children, bless my church, bless my pastor, bless this inland empire with revival. Ma'am, when you pray, let blessing come out of your mouth. I'm telling you, there is power in what you speak. You begin to pray it, believe it. There is blessings that God wants to reign in this house. Come on now, anybody interested in the blessing of the Lord? Amen. There's a verse that says the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. I'm not talking about fake charismatic stuff, but I am telling you there are riches that God wants to rain on his people. Rich in mercy, rich in love, rich in joy, rich in peace. Yes, rich in material things. I believe if you live for God long enough and are faithful with your giving and your life, that God will bless you and smile upon you. And why would you not want the blessings of God to be upon your life? Amen. If you want to be blessed, why don't you just lift your hands and let's just ask God to rain his blessings on our life. Come on, lift your voice to him right now. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen, amen. The blessing is on the man that stays away from these, this progressive generation described in verse number one. Well, it gets a whole lot better in verse number two when it says this. That this man, this blessed man, not only stays away from stuff, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Anybody thankful for the word of God today? And in his law doth he meditate day and night. This, this verse here, uh, there's, a, there's a, obviously a lot of corollaries, but Joshua 1 and 8 is a beautiful uh, corollary parallel scripture Joshua 1 and 8 where the Bible says that that this this is Joshua speaking this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night I'm going to tell you there is a power in just thinking and chewing and digesting the word of God you know it's one thing for us to get up here and teach and preach it but church thank God for you that get your Bibles out and read it every day 
Thank, there's, there's something beautiful about after church talking to people about the word of God. Calling people up. I've been studying this. What does it mean? You know what that is? It's like a cow chewing its cud. Just ruminating over the, be- the, the beauty of the word of God. Chewing it up. Digesting it. I, I heard somebody say a while back, if we're not careful, we'll read the Bible like we read social media. Or the news. You read the news and it's just kind of, you know, you just kind of read the highlights or the headline and move down to the next section in your newspaper if, or whatever. I doubt anybody here even gets a paper anymore. Uh, wherever you, you're reading your news. And, and, uh, but, but, but the word of God is not to be read like that. You don't read it speed read. Now, sometimes I do read it really fast. And, and uh, especially if some of you maybe. be... Uh, Trying to, to try and stay on tack for your, for your one year Bible. God bless you. Just read it and get it done. But, but every now and then you need to chew on that thing. We're not just reading it to see how much we can read. I am telling you there is power in meditating, in ruminating, in thinking, in, 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 in chewing up the word of God. It'll become part of your nature. The Bible says his delight is in the law of the Lord. I like that. We ought to delight in the law of the Lord. There ought to be a smile that comes when you read his word. There ought to be joy that comes when you hear the preaching of the word of the Lord. There ought to be an excitement to be fed. I I, I tell you, there is strength in receiving God's word. Church, don't ever get tired of coming to the house of God, being faithful to the house of God. Amen. Bring your family every time these doors are open. I say this uh, occasionally, but it's, it's because it's true. This is not a Sunday morning church. Amen. The rest of the denominal world can do what they do. But the Bible does talk about, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews warns, uh, he says, uh, uh, and not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Even back then in those days, there were people that were avoiding going to the house of God. But the writer of Hebrews says, but so much the more. Going to church so much the more. Assembling so much the more. As you see the day approaching. I'm going to tell you we don't need less church. We need more church. I know we're busy. But we need to cut out other stuff. We need the word. I need to be fed. Come on. This is right. We need to be in God's house. And if you say I don't have time to be at church. Then maybe you need to re uh, look at your priorities. Maybe you need to take another look at your work schedule. Maybe you need to take another look at life. Because ultimately there is a blessing in delighting in the law of the Lord. In being in God's house. In receiving and digesting the word of God. In anybody glad they said unto me let us go to the house of the lord amen and can i tell you that meditating in god's word is is associated with some neat stuff the bible says in joshua 1 and and verse number 8 this book of the law shall not depart out of the mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein and then it says for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous everybody say prosperous i'm sorry i said i wouldn't do that again And then thou shalt have good success. I won't make you say success. I'll say it again. Success. Prosper. Success. Isn't that? Those are Bible words. I'm going to tell you, there is strength in God's word. There is a lift that comes from God's word. There is a pick me up. There is a motivation. There is a, you want to get inspired to go to work on Monday? Come to church on Sunday. You want to be inspired to be a better husband? Read your Bible. You want to be inspired to get up and just change your world and climb Mount Everest? Get in the Word of God. You want to be inspired to lose weight? Read the Bible. You want to be inspired to run 15 miles? Read. I'm telling you, I get in the Word of God and I want to be better in every direction. I want to go out and shoot 50 free throws in a row. I read my Bible and I want to go beat my kids at basketball. I read my Bible and I want to go clean the garage. There is power. There's prospering. There's success that comes emerging from the Word of God. Zig Ziglar may get you motivated, but I'm going to tell you there's something more powerful than Zig Ziglar and some of these motivational speakers. Go to Paul, go to Peter, go to Moses, go to David, go to Jesus, and let the word of God speak into your life. Amen, amen. The Bible says that associated with meditating in the word of God is this kind of stuff. Is, is, is obedience and, 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 and purpose. In other words, you'll have... Um, You'll obey the word. You'll, you'll understand why we do what we do. You know, it's important to know why you're doing what you're doing. 
if you don't have a reason and a motivation to life, you're going to flounder. Just wander. You know, our world is afflicted with people that have no reason for living. How sad when you read the statistics of people that are trying to take their life right now. Suicide is, is, is going nuts in young people. And, and, uh, and, and especially, I was re- just, especially those with, that, are, that are dealing and delving in immorality. The statistics of those that are delving and, 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 and contemplating or trying suicide is through the roof. Can I tell you, in many cases, it's because they have no reason to live. They've lost their purpose. I, brother, brother Adam Pierce was telling me about a book. And I've, 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 I've downloaded it on Audible, but I haven't heard it all yet. But it's a, it's a military man that is, he's telling his story. But he made a statement. He said, he said, when the most important thing, this military officer said, the most important thing that a man can take to war with him is the reason why. More important than armament, more important even than training and discipline, more important than support back home is knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing. Church, if you want to do something great for God, you need to know why you're living for God. Why am I even trying to be the husband that I'm supposed to be? Why, what's the point of being a wife that, that, that is obedient to the word of God? What's, what's the point of being a young person, of being an elder that, that is in alignment with the word of God? When you begin to read the word of God and you get a reason why down in your spirit, I'm telling you, it'll inspire you. You'll, you'll be different than you ever were before. It'll make you want to obey the word of God. I, uh, I heard a story of Mark Twain, the the famous American author, he was, there was a, a businessman in uh, the city of Boston. And uh, he was not, this businessman was not known for being a particularly good guy or uh, especially ethical. And uh, he was known for, he would, he would do whatever it took to get his way. And, uh, and so he's, he, he, was, he was talking one day, he said, I'm, you know what I'm going to do? He told Mark Twain, I am going to Israel. I'm going to the Holy Land, and there's nobody going to stop me. I'm going to go to the Holy Land, and when I get there, I'm going to Mount Sinai, and when I get to Mount Sinai, I'm going on the top of that mountain, and I'm going to get the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to read them at the top of my lungs, just read the Ten Commandments out loud, and Mark Twain looked at him and said, I got a better idea. Why don't you just stay in Boston and keep them? I'm going to tell you, it's more important that we know why and obey the word of God, you meditate, you chew on this stuff, it'll get in your spirit. You'll, the Bible talks about the word becoming flesh. This Bible can actually, and I understand that's dealing with the incarnation of Jesus Christ, but this word will actually become flesh in our lives. This scripture that we're reading and so literally we're being lifted up into the perfect pattern of who we're supposed to be. His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. And can I tell you that the Bible then says in verse number three, and I want you to listen up now. He, this man, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now I want to take a little bit to talk about some of this. First of all, this, this idea of prospering. He'll, he'll, for, let's, let's, take it, let's take it in order in the verse. He'll be like a tree planted. I tell you, there is, there's power in a tree that has been planted. It's the will of God that we have a root system that is down deep, deep, deep into the ground. Uh, I, I've heard that some of the, the big redwood trees, the sequoia trees, huge, uh, the biggest living uh, things in the world, these, thing, these trees. When you look at them, it's, it's mind-boggling. I, I, I can't remember... Is it the, uh, anyway, there's one tree that's, it, it has a name, and actually it's so big that it has a branch that has a name. I think it's the General Grant tree and the General Sherman branch. That branch alone could build like 40 houses. It has so much wood in it. And, uh, and yet they say that these trees have as much wood underground as they do above ground. When you look at those monster trees, they've got a root system that is, that is down, 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 and moving out. 
I'm going to tell you, church, we got to be planted in this thing. We got to be rooted in this thing. Paul said in Ephesians 3 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Paul said in Colossians 2 and 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith. Colossians 1, Paul said again, uh, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. I'm glad that I've been saved today. I'm not living in that world anymore. He said, now you've been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unmovable in his sight. You're unmovable if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. I, you know what's exciting about talking to this class in this particular setting at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning? I'm talking to a bunch of people that have been rooted in the faith. Amen. I'm thankful for young people that have got it. And we got some young people that have been rooted. But I'm looking at some of you that for years have lived the truth of this gospel. I'm looking at some of you. You've got a root system that goes down. You've been through fires You've been through floods. You've been through church problems. You've been through family problems. You've been through financial problems. And you're still here, rooted and grounded in the faith. I'm talking to some elders today. If I could hand you the microphone, you could tell stories that would curl some of you, some of our hair today. What you've been through, sickness and trouble and trial. But all that did was cause you to put those roots down further. And today you're like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing that can move some of you. There ain't a devil in hell that could not want some of you over. There ain't a trouble in a trial that could take you down. You got your mind made up. I ain't moving. I ain't, I'm, I ain't, I ain't getting shifted. I ain't getting uh, knocked over. I ain't falling down. I'm living for Jesus, grounded and settled and rooted and planted in this truth. Oh, hallelujah. Anybody glad you can be that kind of a tree? Amen. If you're just getting started in this Christian walk, listen, you can be that. That's the pattern. That's where we're headed. Planted by the rivers of water. Now, I like that. The Bible says by the rivers of water. It it, it matters where you're planted. Can I tell you that? It matters where you're at. You need to be in a place where there's water that is flowing. It matters that you're in a place where the Spirit of God is moving. Aren't you thankful for the spirit of God that he gives to his church? Aren't you thankful for the word of God? I don't understand people that they get into trouble and they're going to backslide. I'm going to just tell you, the answer is not to go to the desert. The answer is not to find a dry place. The answer is to get more water. Put those roots down. I I was reading yesterday in Leviticus chapter 11. and, And I haven't developed all this, but it certainly caught my attention. It's one of those... uh, Places in the book of Leviticus, if you're not careful, you'll read really fast because it's, it's really, uh, well, it can be a little bit dry. And he's talking in Leviticus 11 about the animals that the, the, uh, the Jews should not eat. They, first of all, he says that uh, if you're going to eat these animals, they have to uh, split the hoof and they have to chew the cud. In other words, they need to have an external uh, way that you can... Tell that they're clean and they need to have an internal way that you can tell that they're clean. And I could stop and preach about that. Holiness within and without. But he then goes on, he starts listing these animals. Birds, weird birds that they could eat and some weird birds they could not eat. Up around verse number 29, he starts listing. And the Bible calls them creeping things that they could not eat. And uh, the King James uses words like ferret. Aren't you glad that, well, I guess you can't eat it now. We're in the New Testament if you were so inclined. Uh, ferrets and chameleons, and uh, uh, not chameleons, but maybe it is, I don't remember. There's, there's like five or six of them. And really a lot of them are, are the King James uses words that, that maybe are talking about different animals. But bottom line, they're not any kind of animal you'd like to eat. And then the Bible says this in verse number, I think it's 33. It says, if one of those animals dies, if a... If a mouse dies and falls into a a, a pitcher, like an earthen vessel of water, falls inside that thing. And uh, again, the Bible, a lot of this is dealing with hygiene and stuff and protecting the people. But there is significance beyond that. He says if if a mouse dies and falls into this pitcher of water, this earthen vessel, you get rid of that mouse, you dump out the water, and then you break that pitcher and throw it away. It's unclean unto you. It's unclean unto you. 
that water is contaminated. But then in verse, I believe it's verse number 36, he makes this statement. He says, however, if that mouse dies and it falls in a fountain of water, or if that mouse falls in a pit of water, a large area of water, the Bible says uh, that the, the water surrounding it is unclean, but that fountain is okay. And that pit of water is okay. You know the difference between verse 33 and the earthen vessel and verse 36 and the fountain and the pit? It's basically the amount of water and that that water is flowing. I'm going to tell you, church, there's something about being in a place where there's a lot of water and that water is moving. We got to have the moving of the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean you can just sin and do anything you want and it's going to be okay because the Holy Ghost is here. But I am telling you, come into the house of God, that Holy Ghost, it'll take care of a lot of stuff. Sinners will run to the altar. Sin will be taken care of by people saying, I'm sorry, Jesus. We get in an apostolic service, enough people start worshiping. You're either going to get in or get out because the power of God is going to convict your heart. Aren't you thankful for the moving of the Holy Ghost? A well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the Bible says you'll be like a tree. Listen, this is the goal. This is the pattern. This is where we're headed. Don't you want your marriage to reflect this? Don't you want your job to reflect this? Don't you want your work ethic and your integrity to reflect this? Don't you want your friends to reflect this? Don't you want your church to reflect this? In fact, I believe it's the will of God for the Inland Empire to be like this tree planted by the rivers of water. Church, this is the goal. This is where we're headed. The Bible says then this tree will bring forth fruit. Oh, I like that part. It'll bring forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now let's talk about being fruitful. Is there anybody that would say, I want to be producing fruit for God? I, I don't want to be a, a tree that's barren. I, 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 I've, I've, uh, I was over at, in Riverside a couple days ago, down by the Mission Inn, there was a there was, I look on the ground and there's oranges, beautiful oranges just laying on the ground. And I look up and there's an orange tree. And in that orange tree, there's oranges all over the place. I want to be that kind of a tree. I don't want to be the kind of tree that we have at home. We have a tree at home, an orange tree that calls itself an orange tree. And it don't do nothing. Now, it may have something to do with the owner thereof, that he don't water it, and it ain't planted by a river of water. I promise you that. Um, but, but I want to be a tree that's bringing forth fruit in his season. I want to grow. I want to bring forth. Can I just tell you, church, it's not the will of God for us to be the same tomorrow as we are today. I want to, bring, I, I want to grow in God. I want to bring forth more fruit next week than this week. And you know what? This is good teaching right now. You need to be pushed to say, God, I want to be better tomorrow. I want to grow. I, I, I'm thankful for how my home is, but I, I want my home to just keep on getting better. I, I'm thankful for my prayer life, but I want to grow in prayer. I'm thankful for the level of faith that I have. I've seen miracles, but I want to believe God for more miracles tomorrow than I ever have in my life. I, I'm thankful for the love of God that I have, but I want God's love to be shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. I'm glad for the peace that I have, but I'm telling you, I don't have enough peace in my heart. I want more peace in my life. You need to be praying, God, I want to be fruitful. I, I want to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I want my life to reflect a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'll tell you, I want more power with God. I'm thankful. And can I tell you, we got power with God. Amen. I'm going to say that again. You have got power with God. Your prayers affect God. Your prayers are listened to by God. But church, we need to understand there is more power and fruitfulness than we've ever had before. And we need to be pushing and praying that God would give us that kind of fruitfulness. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. I, I would like for our musicians to come. I'm, I'm getting close to the end here. A good question to ask is, what kind of fruit should I be producing? Well, I'll tell you. I just mentioned the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. All of these things are fruit that we should produce. But church, I also believe that, 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 that one of the crops we should be producing is souls. We need to be bringing forth fruit in our season. And it's the will of God that everybody in this place is involved in that process. 
Now, we are a body, and different people work differently. Different people are involved in different ways in producing fruit. Some of us may be involved in the sowing process, literally inviting, knocking Bible studies. Others may be involved in the watering process with prayer and tears and fasting and, 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 and involved in the, in the discipling process. But I believe it is God's will that when we get to heaven, every one of us can somehow say, I touched a soul that is here in heaven. I used to get so convicted before I won my first soul. People would say, you know, they, they would preach it so strong that, you, you know, you wonder if you're even saved if you'd never won a soul. And I, I don't preach it like that, but I am telling you there at least, if you're healthy, you ought to be producing. If you're, if you're living for God right, there ought to be a part of you that's involved in the soul winning process of producing souls for God. I tell you, it's a great way to live. It's a great way to live, bringing souls to God. It's a joy. You want to you have a, I, I, last, just in the last little bit, there was something that, that, that came my way. It was a little bit negative, depressing, and I was just down a little bit. And I went somewhere, and, and when you get down, you know, what you, you, sometimes the best answer is just go to Minchie's and get a frozen yogurt. <laughs> and put stuff all over it. And I did. And uh, it kind of worked, not, not, not so hot, but as I was leaving, I invited the lady to church. And as I'm inviting her, she, she was interested, and, and she's looking, and she's asking. And when I left, she was still staring at that card. And I walked out, and I said, God, that's why Joel Booker is on earth. That's why I'm even here, because God wants me to be involved in soul. Oh, hallelujah. I'm just talking to somebody today. The goal is being like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in season. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I'm telling you, that is the pattern that God has for every life in this place today. Why don't we lift our hands? In fact, why don't we stand our feet and lift our hands right now? Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord. Let's thank him for his presence. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, lift your voice to the Lord for just a minute longer. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to finish with this. Psalm 1. You got to have something to shoot for, church. If you're going to be what God wants you to be, you got to know what God wants you to be. Number one. You need to be like Jesus. And number two, there's passages all through this Bible that are a pattern for us. Psalm 1 is one of those. I don't want to be walking in the counsel of the ungodly. I don't want to stand in the way of sinners. I don't want to sit in the seat of the scornful. But I want my delight to be in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And church, we can be like a tree planted by the rivers of water bringing forth fruit in his season and whatsoever we do will prosper again if that's how you feel and that's your desire won't you just lift your hands and say god i want that blessing on my life come on as we begin to move into the next part of this service i love you jesus